Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to one of our monthly afternoon lectures. And if you're listening online, uh, a very welcome to you as well. And just to say that uh, um, this one in July, um, there's, no, there's no meeting in, in July or August. So this meeting today on the 12th of June is, is the final one until we have a, a summer break. And then on the 11th of September, you may have some notification that it's Dr. Walter Riggins, but it's not. We've got our uh, own in-house speaker, and really pleased that Marie Wheeler will be speaking on the 11th of September, and she's going to be speaking about grace and glory, doing a biblical study on those key themes and how they complement and how, how they differ from each other. So um, really looking forward to that um, from Marie, and I think she's also hopefully going to write an audit press paper on that same theme. So that should be great. That's grace and glory. Um, but today, um, we're delighted that we have Robin Aldridge. Robin was a former CEO here of CMJ UK, one of our trustees. Uh, is also very active in the work of CMJ Israel, being on the Israel board, and uh, got a lot of experience. And uh, we're really delighted, Robin, you could give us some time today. Robin will be speaking for about 45 minutes on the key theme of the relevance of CMJ today. Is CMJ relevant today? I'm hoping that the answer might be yes. <laughs> that's, my, that's my hope, which I'm holding on to. And then hopefully, Robin, if, if you're happy, we'll have about 10 minutes of Q&A yeah. at the end. So will you please give a huge rub, welcome to Robin Aldridge. Is CMJ relevant today? Thank you. Right, great. Well, it's like talking to the, fam talking to the family. Um, that's really nice. Um, and uh, I suppose in one, in one sense, it sounds like a bit of an odd title. Um, but when I was praying about, uh, about this um, and, uh, and what it was that the Lord wanted me to, to focus on, um, I think the thing that came through from this was that it was a good opportunity to encourage those of you who work for CMJ and those of you who support uh, CMJ uh, to be reassured uh, about our vision uh, and the things that drive us. Because um, actually we do, we do kind of face some interesting difficulties and we have some for some time. You see, CMJ can be perceived by some people as an old-fashioned uh, ministry. It's done some good stuff in the past, but actually, its best days are gone by, and it's not really relevant to today. I mean, what, some of the things that feed that, that view from the outside would be, I suppose, we have been around 210 years. Um, we're the oldest Jewish ministry in existence. Yes, we have done great things in the past. Uh, yes, we did have missions all over Europe and the Middle East. We employed over 200 evangelists. We were the largest missionary organization in the UK at one time uh, with the money to back it up. Um, but of course now we're much smaller, we're much less influential. Secondly, um, our support base consists mainly of older Christians. And therefore, when people look round, they might say, oh yeah, well this is just... This is just for the old folk. I, I remember when we uh, persuaded our family to come to the first uh, CMJ conference, which was uh, out at the Hayes at Swanwick, and they had an absolutely great time. They brought the kids with them, you know. And afterwards, I said to them, so what were your abiding memories of the, of the weekend? And Matthew, my son, said, how old the supporters are. <laughs> and then my daughter said, and what great people they are. Um, so, so that, again, has kind of, I think, coloured people's view about CMJ. Um, another thing that will have uh, actually touched you, uh, who work here more than most, is the fact that nowadays, actually, we struggle to finance uh, the ministry. You know, if it wasn't for the fact that some wonderful people uh, leave us legacies, you know, we wouldn't even be afloat uh, today. And fourthly, there are ministries now that focus on Israel itself and on supporting the nation state of Israel. And they seem to be much more exciting. They meet with Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, 
They have their photograph taken with the Israeli ambassador. They are the ones that have uh, up-to-date coverage of what's happening in Israel. They're on trend. They've got fancy websites. They're into social media. Now look, John has done an awful lot to update our presence in all those things. But those ministries have a much greater resource than we have to plough into them. And they're seen to be where it's at now. And I think all that can be actually quite discouraging uh, for those of us who are working for and involved in CMJ. So why do you work for CMJ? <laughs> why do we support CMJ? Why should we? What, what is its relevance today? Couldn't it just pack up and go home and everything would carry on as normal? Well, in looking at that, I want us to root ourselves in Scripture I want us to root ourselves in covenant, and I want us to root ourselves in prophecy, and then look at the times that we live in now. So, evangelical believers in the past absolutely believe that all scripture was God-breathed. Evangelical believers today, you can't necessarily guarantee that that is their position. People who we thought would have understood scripture like we do, don't. And yet they would call themselves evangelical believers. So, we are people who believe in the whole counsel of God. We believe that what he said in the past about what he is like, what he said in the past about what he will do, are absolutely reliable. Those things he will do, and his character and his nature will not change. He is in control of the affairs of man. So when the Holy Spirit was poured out on this nation in the early 1800s, there was actually a fresh revelation about Scripture that was released at that time. And that always happens when the Holy Spirit is poured out. You get praise and worship, and also then you get this greater understanding of the depth of God's Word. And as they read their Bibles afresh, and particularly as they read the Old Testament afresh, uh, the Hebrew Scriptures, they saw that God had made three main covenants with the Jewish people, but after 1,800 years, there was no indication that any of them had been fulfilled. Now, actually, that's fairly depressing, isn't it, when you think? People have been looking and praying about these things for all that length of time. And there's no sign that these covenants, two of which are unconditional, are going to be fulfilled. At that time, the Jews were scattered across the earth, the land was under the Ottoman Empire, and the unconditional covenant of national Israel had all but been forgotten. And the Jews certainly were not a blessing on the earth, nor had they been a blessing to the nations. So that unconditional covenant through Abraham of return to the land, um, of, of the covenant with him and the Jewish people, um, there wasn't a sign of the, that it had and was going to be fulfilled. But in 1800s, the people who read their Bibles actually had a fresh dose of faith and belief and said, it can happen because it says it in Scripture. So we're going to be people who not only pray about it, we're going to be people who do something about it as well. You see, it's quite depressing if you, if you only look at the covenant, the Mosaic covenant with the Jews, which is a conditional covenant. Unless they lived in line with Torah and the consequence blessings that would throw upon them, they were going to be cast out, cast for, scattered. It was a conditional covenant and the Jews had blown it. They had not kept their side of the bargain and God had cursed them and scattered them. They apparently had no future. And then, of course, there was the new covenant that was described in Ezekiel and Jeremiah. One day, God was going to enter into a new relationship with the Jewish people. He was going to take away their heart of stone he was going to give them a heart of flesh. He was going to wash them clean and they would be clean. He was going to write his word on their hearts. But first, before he did that, 
he was going to return them to the land. However, there was no sign of that happening either. Now, given these circumstances, wouldn't it have been easy for the people at that time to have given up on all those issues and said, actually, let's concentrate on the poor and the dispossessed in this country? Miraculously, and I believe it was a miracle, that's not what happened. The church caught the vision of the fulfilment of these covenant promises and as a consequence, one of the consequences of that was CMJ was formed. And what fueled it? Faith in the word of God and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God had said in his word he would fulfill two unconditional covenants with the Jews. There would be a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine where they would live and then God was going to pour out his spirit on them and they would have a new heart. They would hear the gospel. They would accept Jesus as their Messiah. I think it took great faith and courage um, and vision to actually continue to work and pray when there was only limited encouragement in front of your eyes. Yes, some Jews came to faith in Jesus, praise God, but largely they were then assimilated into the church and they were no longer recognisable as Jewish people. The Ottoman Empire was a powerful caliphate at that time. It wouldn't let Jews or Christians practice their faith in the empire, let alone in Palestine or Jerusalem. So it looked as though things were pretty bleak and things were a real mess. But God. But God. And they had to wait from 1809 to 1948, which is a long time, to actually see the first part of that Abrahamic covenant regarding the land come into force. Can a country be formed in a day? Yes. 14th of May, the land, the state of Israel came into existence. For many evangelical Christians, this was not only the fulfillment of prophecy, it was the beginning of the end times. So, for CMJ, it turned out to be a mixed blessing. The Jews began their aliyah back to Israel. They won the war of return, and we lost access to Christchurch, and the old city was held by the Jordanians. But the formation of Israel had a worldwide impact. Let's look at some of the things that happened as a result of that. It produced an angry backlash among the Muslims who were not only defeated, but the Islamic land was occupied by infidels who must be killed or displaced or driven into the sea in order for the name of Allah to be honoured. It also began the Palestinian narrative the whole story of a dispossessed and oppressed people who deserved worldwide sympathy because they had been persecuted by the Jews. It triggered worldwide alia as Jews from around the world felt the call of God to return to the land, given to them as an everlasting covenant. It also triggered the formation of several parachurch ministries uh, which were formed to express the intention of standing with the state of Israel. So CFI, PFI, uh, other uh, ministries in the USA who focused on prayer and encouragement for Israel and prayed particularly about the security uh, of the land. And boy, did they need to. But as Israel became stronger militarily and economically, it triggered another reaction, anti-Semitism. You didn't need now to directly have a go at the Jews or Jewish people, accuse them of worldwide hegemony or whatever else. Your attack could be against the state of Israel. And that wasn't anti-Semitism, was it? Yes, it was. And it took on a new life and a new direction uh, as a result of that. And what about us in CMJ? 
Well, we continued to work to share the gospel with Jewish people, but it was hard. You see, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob had fulfilled his covenant to the Jewish people. They were returning to their own land. It was blossoming as a result of that. Things were going really well for them. They were winning wars that they should never have won. They were not interested in a Messiah because God was already fulfilled the covenant that they were interested in, which was the Abrahamic covenant. But for those who knew their Bibles, the clock was ticking away towards the fulfillment of the third great covenant to the Jews, the new covenant. And for people who read their Bible carefully, the order was very clear. Ezekiel writes in chapter 36 and 25 and 24, For I will take you among the nations, I will gather you out of all countries, and I'll bring you into your own land. Step one. Step two. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Thirdly, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You see, the order and the process are quite clear. First, the physical return to the land, and then the spiritual rebirth of the Jewish people by the work of the Holy Spirit. CMJ waited again patiently for the new covenant to be poured out on the Jewish people. And from the establishment of the Jewish state, we waited 19 years until, on the 7th of June, 1967, Israel recaptured the old city of, and Jerusalem was reunited. It became the united capital of Israel for the first time in two and a half thousand years. For us, it signalled a shift of the centre of our work from London to Jerusalem as Christ Church again became the centre of the work in Israel. We started to see the rise of Messianic Judaism as the beginning of the fulfilment of Romans 11. The major role of the church in the end times is sharing the gospel with Jewish people and the support and encouragement of the Messianic movement. And as prophecy has been fulfilled in our time, so we have to adjust our ministry to line it up with what God is doing. And one of the shifts that took place then was the emergence of the beloved three E's. Evangelism, education and encouragement. Our commitment to share the gospel with Jewish people, to educate the church in its responsibility, to pray for the salvation of the Jewish people and to encourage the support and growth of Messianic congregations. Those three things are still right on the money today. You see, the next great prophetic event that we're waiting for is Paul's message in Romans 11. And so all Israel shall be saved. And what will it be like, says Paul? Life from the dead. We are waiting for a moment at which there is going to be such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the Jewish people that it actually spreads out from there worldwide. Yes, we pray for Israel today. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But mostly, we should work and pray that the great new covenant that God made with his people through his prophets will be fulfilled as he pours out his spirit on the Jewish people. As this happens, as the full number of the Gentiles are brought in, as the Jewish people pray, Baruch Abar B'Shem Adonai, that will be the great signal for the return of the Lion of Judah.
the Mashiach, the Son of God, Yeshua, Jesus. You see, with, along with Jews for Jesus, Messianic testimony, this ministry is working to bring that about. And not only have we been faithful to this calling for 210 years, we are now starting to see the latter rains fall. The Messianic community is growing and developing. There are estimated, and nobody knows the number, you keep asking people and you get different answers, but around about 25,000 Messianic believers in Israel, but 350,000 Messianic believers worldwide. We were, we were doing a study last night in our group on, uh, on Revelation, and we were speculating that the 144,000 male Jews who are sealed are, in fact, Messianic Jews. And I thought, well, if there are 350,000 worldwide, there must already be 144,000 of them ready and waiting. But maybe, maybe they have to be in Israel uh, in order for that to take place. I don't know. But things are moving. The outcome, according to Paul, is that, is that all Israel will be saved when the full number of the Gentiles has come in and then the end will come. And we know, don't we, that the end that is signaled by the return of Jesus is going to be in Jerusalem. You see, we are now quite firmly, we probably always have been, but I think it's clearer now, we are in CMJ an end time ministry. It's, we are working like we're working, we're supporting like we're supporting. Why? Because we want to bring about the return of Jesus. That's what we're doing. And what higher calling can there be than that? Which is why we face great challenges today. It's why this calling brings with it opposition. But we need to hold our nerve at this time, I believe. And what we don't need to do is to seek popularity. What we're doing is actually never going to be popular because the enemy hates what we are doing and we will always have opposition. But actually something has changed more recently because CMJ has gone through a change which means that those of us working in this country now are working for CMJ UK and therefore we have a particular focus on this country, on this nation. We have a new vision statement. I won't ask the members of staff to quote it. I'll read it for you. Uh, our vision is that the church in the UK acknowledges and understands its Hebrew roots. The debt it owes to the Jewish people. Rejects replacement theology. Shares the gospel with Jewish people. And prays for Israel. <laughs> a great vision that we might live in a country where the churches in this land do that. Do we see a great hope in that at the moment? Maybe not so much. Maybe not so much. But I'm going to tell you some, some promising things. But that, I think, is just a wonderful vision. Because what it acknowledges is that actually it isn't our job to try and convert or share the gospel with the 284,000 Jewish people who live in the UK. We're too small to do that. We can help other people to do that, and we can do a bit of it ourselves. But what that vision acknowledges is that at this time, unless we can move the church's stance and understanding of Scripture so that it rejects replacement theology, it re rejects two covenant theology, that it actually says in the end times we have an overwhelming mandate from God to share the gospel with the Jewish people because that is part of the triggering of the return of Jesus. So, I believe that that is a challenging but, but spot on, end time priority. 
It's going to require hard work. It's going to require prayer and a miracle. But it's interesting because in the last few months, Sue and I have actually been really encouraged. And we have a sense in our spirits that the tide is beginning to turn in relation to the church. Since April, we have been asked to lead three Passovers in churches that have never had a Passover before and whose leaders have not seen clearly the place of the Jewish people. You see, in all three churches, what triggered the invitation to us was the people in the congregation asking their pastors and vicars, let's have a proper Jewish Passover and let's learn from that. And the response from all three of the pastors and, and vicars in those churches was actually very encouraging. One of them um, was a man who plays golf with Stephen Sizer who some of you will know is, is uh, the devil incarnate. No, he's not. He's a, I'm sure he's a lovely man, but he, uh, he certainly doesn't sympathise with CMJ. So this man who golfs with Stephen Sizer has also got a couple of Messianic believers in his congregation who met and talked with him over a couple of years and eventually got to the point of saying to him, can we have a Passover? And this dear man said, yeah, okay. So we went over and did the, the Passover in his church. He and his wife were there. And, um, and at the end of it, we went over to them yeah, and said, Hi, how did you find that then? And his response was very interesting. He said, actually, he said, all I've heard tonight is the gospel. You see, that man had had an understanding that what we were talking about was not stop evangelizing, you know, the people in Oswestry. It was actually understand where the focus of your prayer and, and evangelism and support for evangelism should lie. It's like the, uh, the, the wonderful word um, that came to Reinhard Bonnke, which some of you will have heard, uh, when he was in Africa and his ministry was going nowhere, um, and he said to God, what have I got to do to make a difference to these people in Africa? And God said to him, pray for the Jews. He said, but my ministry is to Africa. God said to him, pray for the Jews and I'll give you Africa. Pray for the Jews and I'll give you the United Kingdom. So, that was encouraging. We've also been part of a team, along with John and Alex, uh, going into uh, a church in Mansfield to do seven services on the biblical feasts. I mean, to be invited in to do that is unprecedented. And I actually thought, however well we've done it, <laughs> however they respond to that, the fact that they asked us to do that is really significant. I hope it leads to other opportunities as well. Only last week, uh, and a couple of my friends here were with us then, uh, I had an invitation to go to a, an AOG church in Nottingham and speak on the place of the Jews in the end times. That's never happened <laughs> to me before, that anybody would actually say, come and preach on that. And when I talked to the pastor about what had happened, he said, he said well, I've done a series on, on Revelation, and he said, at the end of it, somebody said, you really haven't said much about the Jews. Um, and he said, that's because I don't understand the place of the Jews in the end times. So a couple of people in this congregation said, well, what about that bloke who came from Riverside? <laughs> um, couldn't he come and talk to us? And, uh, and I, was, I was really touched because John, who is a great guy, was really humble, I thought, because he said... I don't know much about it, but I know somebody who does. So, so let's have him in and, and talk. So, so that, again, was such an encouragement. There were about 70 people turned up on a Sunday evening when this church doesn't usually have a Sunday evening service. So, uh, this Sunday, I'm preaching on my, at my own church on the 
feast of first fruits. Now that's just what's happening to Sue and I and what's happened in the last few months. I'm sure you will have stories as well of things that have, have happened to you and opportunities that have been created. But I believe that the tide is turning in the work that we face and others alongside us in actually convincing the church that this is not some wacky, out there um, group of people who are, who are fixated on Israel and the Jewish people and can't see anything else. But what we actually are are people who understand the Bible, understand the times that we live in, and understand the priorities that that should give us at the moment. So, as we continue to share the gospel with Jewish people in the UK, as we continue to try and influence the church, what are some of the things that we need to be aware of? What are some of the things that we need to learn? Well, firstly, I think we need to be at ease with being attacked by both Jews and Gentiles who do not understand the prophetic scriptures. It comes with the territory. I think one of the hardest things that that I didn't realize when I came to work with the ministry is that I kind of thought, well, the Jews will embrace us as people, you know, who who are really nice and who love them and who want the best for them, you know, only to discover, in fact, you know, that that was far from their view of us. You know, we were dangerous people. We were trying to destroy Judaism. Um, And therefore, the very people that you are there to help are rejecting you And the very people who should be supporting you are rejecting you as well. And that can be depressing. It can make things seem like hard work. But we need to understand that that's simply because we're doing the right thing and the enemy doesn't like it. Second thing that we should be prepared to do is to confront anti-Semitism in all its forms. And particularly anti-Semitism that comes out of the church. Recently, we here had an opportunity to challenge an anti-Semitic article that uh, was written in the local Southwell Minster magazine. We could have kept quiet. We could have read it and just tut-tutted and said, oh, that's a terrible thing, isn't it? That should never be written. And it shouldn't have been written either. But no, that's not what we did. We actually went on the offensive and we said to the bishop and we said to the dean and we said to the people who wrote the article, that is anti-Semitic. It is not only wrong morally, it is actually against the law of this country. And you need to apologize unreservedly for what you've done. We actually got a quite lukewarm apology from the editor and we challenge that as well and what happens we get an unreserved apology from the dean and pressure from the bishop to make sure that it doesn't happen again will we change the minds of those anti-semitic people who wrote the article no but we're not going to let them get away with it and our job is to challenge anti-Semitism, both as individually as in an organisation, wherever we see it rising up. Thirdly, we need to continue to build CMJ into an international alliance of like-minded people centred on Jerusalem. Though we are CMJ UK, we do actually have a very special relationship with Israel. But rather than the UK seeing itself as the centre, that is quite clearly now in the end times, the centre is Jerusalem. And what we are part of are the spokes that connect national CMJs to the hub, which is in Israel. And yes, okay, we might be one of the more important spokes in that, and there might be some more work to do to develop the others. But I think in these end times, that's the picture that we ought to be looking at. A work which is centred in Jerusalem, in Israel, but has international support and connections from the nations. Because actually, spokes allow things to go in two directions. You can actually input prayer and finance and whatever else, but actually there can be a conduit of blessing as well that goes out from the centre. 
I believe that we should continue to encourage Messianic believers to work with us, but not just see them as second-class citizens, not just see them as Johnny-come-latelys. Uh, we know all the stuff that there is to know because we've been, we've been believers a long time. Now, as the Messianic movement and the Messianic church and Messianic believers mature, develop and grow, we should be looking for opportunities to let them lead the work. We should look looking to see real partnership because the, the church in these end times will be Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah. I'm bringing it very close to him. We need to continue to run a faith budget. We've been doing this for some time. But as we move towards the end of the age, I believe we must be prepared to trust God for our future. If he has got a future for this ministry, he will see that it is resourced. He'll see that it can continue to do the job that he's called it to do. We can be confident that God, who began this great work, will see it to completion. So, where does that leave us? Well, I believe that we stand on the shoulders of giants. But, we stand. We don't bend. We don't bow down. We stand and we continue to stand. Why? Because we want to see what Paul said in Romans 11. And so, all Israel will be saved. We want to see what Zechariah reminds us of in chapters 14 and 15. And I will pour out on the house of David the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for an only son. And in that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. That is the promise of God. It is sure, it is secure, it can be trusted. What a promise and what a future. If you're listening on uh, on the web or on the audio uh, links, I want to thank Robin for that. Um, I, I certainly felt very very thoughtful, very inspiring, and very reflective um, presentation. So we're indebted to that. And if you're listening, you think, well, how can I respond? Do have a look at the website. Uh, membership of CMJ is available. If you're a church leader, you may want to consider signing up for the Romans 15:8. We also have a really big conference taking place in a few weeks' time. There's a few spaces left, so please consider joining us for the conference at Swanwick. You'll be very welcome to do that. And also, Robin spoke very eloquently about anti-Semitism, and the next edition of our magazine, News and Views, is being completely given over to how we as believers in Jesus engage with anti-Semitism wherever we find it, primarily in the church, but also in political institutions and in the wider culture as well. So that would be a really good thing to do, get hold of that magazine and, uh, and stand with us uh, as, as, we, as we seek to stand for the, for the purposes of God. Now I'm sure I know I had one or two questions buzzing in my mind and there's a chance to have Robin here. So please, if, if, if there's one or two questions, that would be really helpful. So uh, let's see if anybody would have a particular question or a challenge or, or a comment you want to direct to, to Robin. Okay, Any, anything particular jumping out for us? Yeah. Um, but I think that's a good way of reaching out 
which probably includes telegroups and personal uh, communications with people without making a big anti-Semitic type of thing of it. Mm. But, you know, he wanted to know more about scriptures and the Jews um, and God's position um, working through, uh, you know, the, the Vatican prophecy. Um, and that's one way perhaps we can get through to churches mm. who don't, which for a lot of them, they just simply don't understand. I think they're taught anti-Semitism in the colleges. Thank you. I just just say something. The the um, I we have found, and this is just kind of in our church, which is actually quite a big church. Um, but there there is an increasing interest in end times prophecies, uh, and people want to look at the Book of Revelation and and so on. Um, it's very easy. Um, to look at that, completely ignore the Jewish dimension. There are lots of people who write the Jews right out of the scripts uh, for the end times. Um, but, but actually, as you said, John, on riding in on the back of that interest in the end times, if we can say, actually, there's some really interesting dimensions here to do with Israel and the Jewish people, it's the kind of thing people say, oh, really? Oh, I'd like to know a bit more about that. So, yeah, it's a good opportunity. To, just to echo what Robin says about the relevance of the book of Revelation, I've been reading a book by Eugene Peterson who did the, did the message, the, the, the translation of the Bible, and he wrote a book called um, uh, Under an Unpredictable Plant, which talks about vocational holiness. And he just something that really struck me uh, recently in, in the book. I mean, I mean Eugene is now, he, he died a few, a few years ago. But he said, um, Augustine, in struggling with the Roman Empire and corruption, was led to the book of Genesis to be foundational when he wrote The City of God. So Genesis was his go-to text. And in the Middle Ages, uh, with the sort of uh, struggles within the church, um, some, of the early, some of the fathers of the church at that point were led to the Song of Songs. That was their text they always spoke on. The Reformation, Romans, Luther engaging with the Romans. The Romans text was the kind of bedrock for Reformation theology. But the message of the church today is the book of Revelation. So that's interesting. You know, Genesis, Songs of Songs, Romans, Revelation. In those four different sort of epochs, periods of church life. But that's really interesting. Well, oh, I didn't see that, Eugene, but thank you for, for writing that down. I'll, I'll, I'll make a note of that, but I'll give you credit if I, if I mention it publicly. <laughs> that, was, that was really good. You talked, Robin, about doing this opportunity with, with, with John and, and Paul and Janie and myself at, at Mansfield with, with, the, with looking at the festivals. Yeah. We're discussing in our staff meeting if there's an opportunity to follow that up. What, what have a series? I mean, I think Paul's point was the festivals gave us a real point of engagement on this. Yeah. But if we're going to follow that up and we say to a church, we did something on festivals, perhaps next year we could do four or five on, is there anything which you would feel would be another good source of material or subject matter for that kind of teaching? Um, well, two that we've already referred to. Um, I think there's generally a lack of understanding about covenants um, in the church. And um, people not only don't understand the nature of covenant, they don't understand the nature of God's involvement in covenant and, and the fact that he doesn't break a covenant. And, and the, our salvation in Jesus depends upon him not breaking covenant. Therefore, the other covenants that he's made are equally important that we understand what those are about and, and how they still apply uh, today. So that strikes me as being a, a kind of an interesting way in. And then the whole thing about, you know, the end times. If we are, as I believe we are now, an end times ministry, we ought to be prepared to, to say to people, we're very happy to come and talk with you. And, and what I did at, um, at Low Water Street, um, and I think it was helpful, I think other people will, will have views about that, is to actually say, what you're looking at when you're looking at this apocalyptic writing with all these pictures and visions and things in it, um, and they are yet to come, it's... It's very difficult for anybody to get up and say, and this is what's going to happen. 
this is the right interpretation, this is the right understanding of that. But if you kind of get in people's heads this view that when you're looking at prophecy and the prophetic word, it's like standing and looking at a mountain range. You can see the mountains and they look beautiful. And they're definitely there. It's not nobody's imagination. But you can't see past the first mountain range into what lies beyond that. What's the valley like? How far is it between one set of mountains and the other? But actually, as time moves on, and you actually get to the top of a mountain range, you do have a better view. Into, and, it, and I think that starts to limit some of these strange options that people have come up way back in the past. The emergence of messianic, the messianic movement is a very, very significant thing that influences your understanding of those end times uh, scriptures. So, so for me, um, showing and demonstrating how those promises of God have been fulfilled in the last 70 years gives you much more confidence to say something about you know the next 70 uh, years and, and how that's going to work out. So I, for me, those, both those things right. give you Thank good you. opportunities. And I would add to that um, a fantastic resource we have for you to use more is the Kesha course, which is, has a wealth of information historically and biblically, but also mm. the times we're in now, and then also looking at the future, yeah. which, um, you know, Paul and I have done that several times, mm. and people find it absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So, mm. maybe with a church like my school, that would be, mm. that could be, yeah, maybe yeah. more than the whole course, but yeah. like, it's interesting you should say that, Jane, because we have a Sue and I do some work in the local uh, prison, uh, Loudham Grange, and there is a, a newly appointed uh, pastor from uh, a chaplain from South Africa, who is very understanding of things Jewish, and we said to him, "What would you? What do you want to do now? You you know you come here. What kind of courses do you want to run for them?" He said, "I want to do a Kesha course." <laughs> I said, "Really." I said, that's fantastic. Um, I said, maybe you need to have a word with us first, because I said, I think with a group of prisoners, I wouldn't do the whole of the Keshe course. <laughs> I'd do the bit that focused on Jesus at the beginning, uh, and then, then maybe some of the other bits later on. Uh, but, yeah, use flexibly. It's, it's a fantastic resource. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? This is... No, I'm going to close it down. Yeah, thank you. Paul. Just say, Robin, long-standing CMJ staff member, <laughs> how encouraging it is yes. to hear you speaking like this about, you know, we, we talk about the, uh, the history to celebrate and the yeah. future to dread. Yeah. You put a bit of meat on the bone of what the future that we mm. will bear is, and that would be really great. So, really appreciate that. Mm. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Just as Robin said about the things that have moved Robin in recent events, let's not lose track of what's going on. The Bible comes alive. The invitations just flow, don't they? So, yes. Yes. You know, we've got invitations to Korean church conferences that we've never had before. Mm -hmm. We're going to scout groups that we've never had before. It, it just feels different yeah. In, yeah. in that regard. Yeah. You feel as though you're on a crest of a wave and you wonder how big the wave is going to become, mm -hmm. don't you? I, I, I just think it's amazing yes. the yeah. way those things fall in one gear. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you, John. I'm going to ask Alan just to close in prayer, and then we'll. You know, but you want to talk to, to John on a to, to Robin on a one to one, and uh, you know we can just talk among ourselves, which is always encouraging. Don't feel you've got to rush away. Uh, there's coffee and cake and bits and pieces, so please feel stay and chat. There's no cake, sorry. That's a that's a, that's a false prophecy. Oh dear. But uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. There's, there's some biscuits and bits and pieces, I'm sure. So, but do feel free to stay. And again, um, on behalf of all of us, a, a huge thank you to Robert for coming in and giving up an afternoon to, to teach and, and inspire us. It's, it's been great. So, so thank you, Robin. And if you've got your diaries, please mark 11th September, 2 o'clock for a 2.15 start, looking at grace and glory. But I'm going to ask Alan just to close in prayer. Thank you. Lord, we thank you uh, that we can meet together and learn from you through our speakers. Lord, we thank you for Robin, especially the, the, the wisdom and discernment and insight you give them, Lord. Thank you for the message you brought. This is a wonderful organisation, Lord. You're blessed for 210 years. The 
sons of 